welcome to this issue of Discovering Truth at the Movies. Hi, my name is David Lance. Today, in this episode of the Chronicles of Belteshazzar, King Nebuchadnezzar demands that Naaman gather the Magi so that they can declare to him both his dream and its meaning. Nebuchadnezzar suspects them of treachery. Throughout history, a deep state has attempted to take down uh, the nation's leaders, both in ancient times and in modern times. That's what happened in Churchill, uh, Churchill's time in the movie Darkest Hour. And so as we discuss these things today, a question for reflection will be, what happens when a treacherous deep state corrupts a nation? And so I want to encourage you to consider joining me as I read each chapter of the Chronicles of Belteshazzar and provide some commentary. Now, what I do is I read a chapter at a time, and I also include a question for reflection from uh, a, a movie. Also, I'll post these episodes on my podcast, Discovering Truth at the Movies. And I hope uh, to eventually publish the book. So I hope that you will consider joining me uh, for chapter 11, where we talk about the Magi must die. And so without further ado, I'll go ahead and read the chapter. Nebuchadnezzar awoke in a cold sweat. He had dreamed dreams before, but never one so vivid never so so real it was a, as though he stood above his kingdom and looked down on it saw his kingdom as it was today and could it be possible how it would appear in the future this was too great to fathom guard nebuchadnezzar cried out guard by marduk guard two soldiers appeared at his door your command my lord the first of the two responded nebuchadnezzar wasn't sure what his command should be he gazed in their direction and seeing his dream instead of the two soldiers as they fidgeted. Then, snapping out of his trance-like state, he ordered, Gather my magi to me. Now it is time they truly earned their keep. At once, the two saluted and left, and Nebuchadnezzar drew his cloak tightly about himself, staring at the wall, awaiting for their arrival. Nearly two hours had passed since Nebuchadnezzar had ordered his guards to gather his magi in the meeting hall. Nebuchadnezzar was seated in his throne, clearly upset. He had also been drinking, although he did not appear uh, overly drunk. Naaman had never seen him so agitated and not in control of himself. As he looked uh, around at those who were gathered, he saw that some were missing, including Daniel. This was not good, but it could not be helped. Only Haman appeared, appeared to be at ease. Nebuchadnezzar stood and addressed those who had gathered. No one is to discuss this meeting beyond these walls. No one. I've called you here because I have had a dream and it frightens me. I want you all to explain it to me. Two of the court magicians uh, spoke up. O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, live forever. Tell us your dream and we will declare its meaning to you. Nebuchadnezzar, his eyes red from lack of sleep and too much wine, stared them into silence saying i'm not going to tell you my dream you will tell me what it was i dreamed and declare its meaning to me in return i will reward you beyond your wildest imaginations naaman's eyes shifted to hammond and, and who had been uh, there when uh, uh, naaman first arrived had he spoken with nebuchadnezzar had he somehow convinced the king to take his uh, brash stance on the interpretation of his dream, Naaman was sure Haman had uh, some plan. Another of the wise men spoke up. But great king, what you ask is impossible. Tell us your dream and we will declare its meaning to you. Nebuchadnezzar took several steps uh, in uh, the direction of the one who had spoken until he was right in front of the cowering magi. Jamming his finger into the chest of his magician, he said, you are trying to buy time. You have conspired against me, chosen to lie to me. I command you, tell me the dream and declare it to me now. A fourth magician stepped forward and pleadingly said, what you ask is impossible. No one could do this thing that you ask but a god. Naaman, Nebuchadnezzar roared, pointing uh, to the four wise men who had spoken out, seize these four, take them and put them in the pit. Then go and find those who are not here. And when they have all been found, I want all of my magi put to death. 
He looked briefly at Haman and turned to stalk out of the room, leaving everyone except the chief priest anxious and in a panic. As the guards restrained uh, the four who had been foolish enough to speak out, Naaman saw Haman's plan. He would use this opportunity to have Daniel killed. Somehow, he would get Nebuchadnezzar to divulge the dream and then declare its meaning. Naaman knew that he must find Daniel before his guards did, and he had a good idea of where to look. Naaman pounded on the door to the apartment of Daniel and his friends. Open in the name of King Nebuchadnezzar or by the gods, I'll break it down, Naaman shouted. Just as he was preparing to have his guards break down the door, it swung open to reveal Daniel and his three friends. Pointing his sword at Daniel, Naaman said, you are to come with me. Nebuchadnezzar has commanded that you and the other magi be put to death. He looked at the young Hebrew who just stood there. Get a move on or I will drag you there myself. I will come with you, Naaman, but please, there is no need for this, Daniel finally responded. What has happened? Why are you so agitated? Naaman spoke as they rode uh, in his chariot back to the palace, leaving Abednego, Meshach, and Shadrach in their quarters. Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream and has demanded that his magi not only declare its meaning, but describe the dream's contents as well. When they could not do this, Nebuchadnezzar commanded that all the magi be put to death, including those who weren't there like yourself. Naaman didn't want to add that he believed him and had somehow found a way to use this circumstance to get rid of Daniel until he had proof that was an accusation to which he dare not give voice. Naaman, it isn't right that these others die, Daniel said slowly. You must re request an audience from me with Nebuchadnezzar. I will tell him that the God of Israel will reveal his dream to me and its meaning. You are crazy. No man could do such a thing, Naaman retorted. This was too much. The fool had been told he had a death sentence hanging over his head and yet believed he could do the impossible to save himself. Just do as I request, Naaman. My God will do the rest. Besides, look at it this way. If I'm going to die, what difference does it make? Daniel smiled at Naaman and then put his hand on Naaman's shoulder. In a serious voice, he, uh, as if spoken uh, between two close friends and without the slightest hint of fear in his voice, Daniel concluded, do as I ask, all will be well. Well, I want to stop here and, and uh, talk about a personal reflection. You know, a few years ago, the movie Darkest Hour came out. I actually went and watched it on uh, Christmas Eve in between uh, church services. It was the story of how Winston Churchill became the prime minister of England at a point in time when Hitler was attempting to bomb England into submission. King George the, the, uh, the VI, who strongly distrusted uh, Churchill, reluctantly invited him to form a government. Churchill included uh, a guy named Chamberlain and Lord Halifax in his cabinet. Uh, those were uh, two individuals who secretly worked to undermine his authority in the hopes of regaining power. While everyone around Churchill wanted him to negotiate with Hitler, he did not. It is an unfortunate fact that in human history, a deep state uh, sometimes arises to thwart those in power for their own reasons. When our country was formed, the founding fathers were very aware of the history of corrupt people trying to work from within to take over the government. There's even a French word for this, coup d'etat, which it means uh, cutting off uh, the head at the top. The best known example from history was made famous in a play by William Shakespeare, the assassination of Julius Caesar. When I was in sixth grade, I had a teacher, Miss Pletcher, who uh, would have us uh, uh, do abridged Shakespearean plays. We did Hamlet, Macbeth, and Romeo and Juliet in class just for ourselves. I actually got to be Romeo. <laughs> any rate, uh, we also did one for the entire school, Julius Caesar. I played the part of Cassius, a man who was the most shrewd and active member of the conspiracy to assassinate Caesar. Cassius manipulates Brutus into being the spokesperson of the conspiracy as a way to hide his own involvement. I've always remembered a line about Cassius spoken by Julius Caesar, who was played by Rich Meyer back in sixth grade. The line was, Jan Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous.
In the same way that Cassius manipulates the plot uh, against Caesar in Shakespeare's play, I see Haman quietly trying to manipulate and goad Nebuchadnezzar into doing things that will actually hurt the king. Haman does this in order to weaken Nebuchadnezzar so that he can take power. In this chapter, Naaman suspects Haman is behind Nebuchadnezzar's order to kill the wise men. Why? Because Haman wants to get rid of Daniel. He believes that by issuing an order to kill all the Magi, Daniel will be eliminated. And as I uh, wrote in the story, uh, that is what I see going on here. In writing my original novel, The Brotherhood of the Scroll, I spent time looking at the historical fact that some sort of rebellion did indeed take place against Nebuchadnezzar sometime between the years 597 and 592 BC. In fact, some scholars have suggested that the reason Nebuchadnezzar has all the government officials of the Babylonian Empire uh, come to bow down to the statue in chapter 3 of Daniel on the plain of Dura was to force them to take a loyalty oath following the quashing of that rebellion. I chose the name Haman for the leader of the rebellion as that is the name of the antagonist in the story of the book of Esther. Haman schemed to have Mordecai hanged. The story of Esther is never mentioned here in, in, in my uh, book, but if you have a daughters or granddaughters, that is a connection that you might consider making when talking about the story. In the book of Esther, Mordecai was vindicated and Haman was defeated. In the end, Brutus and the others who conspired to murder Julius Caesar were brought to justice. And as we know from more recent history, Winston Churchill was able to fight back against those in his government who secretly wanted him to fail. Churchill went on to save England. If you're a parent or a grandparent, you can, see, you can use stories like these to teach moral lessons that can be applied right up to our current times. The situations can be much more closer to home, like when a, a new principal or a new football coach uh, comes to a school and the old guard of coaches, teachers, and parents want the new person to fail. In the movie Darkest Hour, an imaginary conversation takes place between King George uh, the, the, the VI and Churchill at the prime minister's apartment. I love this exchange in which the king gives Churchill a pep talk. Think of the king as a cheerleader, and this is what the king says to Churchill. Winston, I, you have my support. As your king, I command you, beat the buggers. <laughs> well, that leads to a question for reflection. What happens when a treacherous deep state corrupts a nation? Well, I, I hope that you'll, uh, you've discovered this particular episode of Discovering Truth at the Movies. Um, if you subscribe uh, to uh, my uh, uh, newsletter, Conversations with the Culture, which you can find at wisejargon.com slash at the movies, then uh, you'll get more information about anthologies uh, that I've put together based on past issues of my newsletter. And I'll also send you a, a, a free uh, booklet uh, ebook called Discovering Godly Leadership at the Movies with my thanks. Well, thanks so much for, for tuning in this time. And until next time, God bless. Mm -hmm.